we're looking at a subject. We're looking at the subject of death. So we're going to have to use our Bibles a little bit more than normal. If, if you're not skilled with that, uh, that's okay. Um, just know that we're, we're taking it right out of the Scriptures. And uh, so I hope this will be an encouragement to you as we talk about this this morning. Before we get started, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the privilege of being able to gather together. Lord, uh, we've already been blessed this morning in the Sunday school hour, and, and um, we look forward to um, more encouragement this evening. But I also think, Lord, that there are many in our congregation and uh, beyond who are struggling with this issue of, of death. And so I pray that you will accomplish what you want in our time together. Some of us, it may be pre preparation for things to come. Um, some of us may be um, healing for things that have recently happened. And so we just ask that in all things that you'd be glorified, that your spirit would, would, would take your word and drive it into our hearts and meet the need that we each of us uh, bring this morning according to your perfect understanding and your perfect plan. And so we give this to thee in Jesus' name. Amen. Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of the tree, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, um, up to this point, this is right at the beginning of the scripture, and God has created the universe, he's created um, man, and, and he's talking to Adam specifically. And he says to Adam, here's, here's, you, know, you can eat of anything in here except for one tree. And uh, um, he says, of that one tree, if you eat of that, you're going to die. And so death is mentioned as a possibility. Death comes actually into the human family in chapter 3. And um, just it's kind of interesting... Um, just on my own personal side, I know many of you probably are wondering about what's been happening with, with myself. And thank you, all of you, for your support, your prayers, your kindness over the, the last couple of weeks. It's, it's meant a lot. But um, uh, a Thursday, I think it was the, uh, it would have been whatever Thursday it is, maybe the 6th, I'm guessing. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, my, I'd heard that my dad had taken a turn for the worst the night before. I was looking for airplane tickets and and uh, and it wasn't working out. Uh, anyway, I was a, uh, between talking with Molly, we decided to I would drive to Virginia, meet my uh, sister and brother-in-law, and then we would take their car all the way to Florida. So those of you that are worried, I was traveling all by myself through the night. I did not do that. Okay, so but I so I my brother-in-law and I shared the duties of driving and we got down by the next morning I left up here after after being at your place Alex to check my tires and I got my, my brother-in-law in Virginia and we were at the hospital by quarter of ten the next morning so it really worked well and um, was cost-effective and so I uh, got to my dad's side he never did come awake the time that we were down there so um, but it was great to be there um, it was important for me to be there for my mother and for our family. And actually, uh, I'm, I'm almost, almost 60, not quite there yet. This was the first immediate family member I've ever lost, other than like a miscarriage. It was the first immediate family member. So, I mean, God's been gracious to our family. He really has been. And, um, and my dad was ready to go. I, he was ready to go a year ago. He really was. I believe he hung around because of my mom, because of his love for my mom. And, uh, and so um, on Wednesday morning, about 5.20 uh, a.m., uh, my dad went home to be with the Lord, and it was without pain. Um, you know, he was, he was uh, uh, very comfortable. And I was at, able to be at his side, and I'm, you know, very grateful for that and, and really want to thank those of you that supported me and encouraged me to go. Um, I really know that God wanted me down there. But, so, uh, I, but you know what? Why did my dad die? Because he's a sinner, just like you and I are. That's the reality. And uh, some of the things that struck me was that reality that, you know what, I'm dying too. My hair wasn't always white. I'm dying too. I'm dying, I'm dying because I'm a sinner too. 
The Bible says that wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, and that is Adam and Eve, and death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. My dad died because he's a sinner. And he was a godly man, a great man. I'm really going to miss him. But he was a sinner, just like I'm a sinner. That's why we're all dying. So why death? Why? Well, first of all, we have this clear command of God with a clear consequence. And that is, one tree, don't eat of it. If you do, you're going to die. And then what we find in chapter 3 is a direct disobedience to that command, to that simple command. So let's go to chapter 3. And I want you to notice starting with verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? That's a, that's a lie, by the way. God didn't say he couldn't eat of any tree. He said there was only one tree. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And what you find here is the direct disobedience to God's command. And so what did God say would happen if they ate of the tree? He said they would die. Direct disobedience to God's command is um, the cause of physical death. Then there are immediate consequences that began to happen to them. And why I point these consequences out is because there's more than one type of death. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. But but we see some immediate consequences. Let's notice verse 7. It says, And the eyes of them both were opened. By the way, Satan said that would happen. He said, the day you eat thereof, your eyes are going to be open. Some people tempt young people to drugs because they say, oh, just open your mind. Well, there's some truth in that. There's some truth in that. Yeah, people can have hallucinations and all kinds of things, and, and it can be a pleasurable experience, uh, but they don't tell the whole story, do they? They don't tell everything. Well, that's what devil, the devil's doing here. The eyes of them both were open. They knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together, made themselves aprons. Their eyes are open. The, the, um, the loss of innocence is what you see. And I would submit to you they've already died. Something has already died within them. And there are, there are, there are uh, indications of that. You see shame already. Keep reading. They, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Can I say this? They walked with God before this. Now they're hiding. There is this, there's this, um, uh, this hiding from God that begins, and mankind has been hiding from God ever since. He really has. We've been running from God. And yet here the Lord is such a privilege to be around them. And Adam and Eve would have enjoyed such fellowship and joy, and yet now they're, they're, they're hiding from God. You'll notice another consequence of their fall. Verse 9, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? By the way, did God not know where he was? Sure he did. He knew where he was. It's a question that Adam needed to think about. Where are you? He said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid. Because I was naked and I hid myself. Now we see fear coming into the human. It's just it's popping up another symptom of, of, of death that has already happened. We have shame. We have hiding from God. We have fear. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? And hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. Now what do you call that? Blame, <laughs> Blame shifting. So who's Adam blaming? He's, yeah, some of you, there's two answers. He's blaming the woman and he's blaming God. Because she's the one that gave it to me and you gave her to me. And so God, it's really your fault. What has already died within man? His innocence is dead. 
It's trust. He's believed a slander against God. I'm hearing something. What is that, Lee? Fellowship with God is dead. I would submit to you, he is showing the signs of being spiritually dead. That's what's going on. You'll notice the long-term consequences. Skip down to verse 19. Just, again, we're, we're just looking at the subject of death, so I want you to... Verse 19. God is talking to Adam. He says, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And that's exactly what happens. Man will now die and will decay. Verse 21. And unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Now, if they're being clothed by coats of skins, then what is obviously happening? Animals are dying. And you know why they're dying? Because Adam and Eve sinned. What you're, having, what you're seeing there is the first sacrificial death instituted, which is a picture of the coming sacrifice of Christ. Skip down to verse 22 to 24. It's very interesting here. Why is this even in here? Just, just think about this for a second. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. That's another thing that Satan said would happen, by the way. Satan was technically correct on what he said would happen. He said, your eyes are going to be open. You're going to be as God's knowing good and evil. And that is exactly what happened. He just didn't tell the whole story. God, is, man, God says, he, man has become as one of us to know good and evil. I'm still in verse 22. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man that he placed at the east of the garden of Eden. A, and a flaming sword which turned everywhere to keep the, every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Why is God so concerned that man not eat of the tree of life? He said it up there in verse 22. What's that, Mike? He could live forever in his sinful state. Do you realize that death is an escape from the life and, and, and the body of sin? Death is an escape. It's an awful thing, but it is also an escape. So exactly what is death? Well, I would define death as essentially separation. And there are three different aspects of death that we need to understand. Um, the first one is physical death. And I think that's the one that we think of most. And I quoted a verse earlier. Let me quote it to you again. Romans 5.12 Wherefore, as by one man, that would be Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. I would define physical death as the separation of your body from your soul. And what I mean by your soul is your inner person or your personality. Okay, so when I stood at my father's casket, that was my father's body. It was his frame, but it was not my father there any longer. Does that make, you understand what I'm saying? He's not there. So you can have... Um, uh, people who would, are, are almost identical, Id identical twins, they ha may have very similar bodies, but their souls are completely different. Now, did Adam and Eve... Now, remember chapter 2, verse 17, what God said to Adam before all this happened, he said, Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, now, let me say it again. In the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So my question is, did Adam and Eve physically die that day? They did not physically die that day. Physical death was going to be another, when their body and their soul were separated from each other, that didn't happen yet. It wouldn't happen in Adam's life for several hundred years more. So let's talk about a second type of death, and, and we want to leave uh, Genesis. We're going to go to, to Ephesians, so it's in the New Testament. Okay, it's quite a ways back. It's like four-fifths of the way back through your Bible. Ephesians chapter 2. 
and you want to look at verses 1 to 3. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. There's a second type of death, and that is spiritual death. And I would submit to you that that's what died in Adam and Eve that day. They did not physically die, they spiritually died. And what the spiritual death is, just like physical death is the separation of the body and the soul, spiritual death is the separation of your spirit from God. And your spirit, as I would define it, is your ability to commune and walk with God. Jesus would say that God is a spirit, and they that serve him must serve him in spirit and in truth. Or worship him, excuse me, must worship him in spirit and in truth. That would be John 4 and verse 24. So Ephesians chapter 2, notice if you would, starting with verse 1. And, and you hath he quickened or made alive, by the way, that's inserted there, who were dead in trespasses and sins. So, He's talking to living people. He's talking to, to Christian people who've been converted. This is why he says you, you've been made alive. He said, but you were dead in trespasses and sins. Well, they weren't dead physically. They were dead spiritually. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. Now, who's the prince of the power of the air? That'd be Satan. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom... Also, we all had our conversation. We all had our manner of living in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, notice it, by nature, the children of wrath, even as others. That's why everyone needs to be born again, because everyone is dead spiritually. Okay, we're born spiritually dead. And how that happened... And I skipped the verse, I when I, we were back in Genesis, I should have showed you, but if you looked at chapter 5, and I think it's like the first three verses, it says how, um, you know, Adam was created in, in whose image? God's image. Okay, but now he's a sinner. And it says that Adam fathered a child by the name of Seth in his own image, after his own likeness. Specifically, it says that. His own image, his own likeness. What's it saying? Man's, man, we still have the image of God upon us, but it's been marred by sin. And so, subsequent generations all the way back from Adam, now all the way down to you and I today, we are born in sin. We're born spiritually dead, spiritually separated from God. So just as physical death is the separation of the soul and the body, spiritual death is the separation of the spirit from God. And as I see it, this is exactly what died the very day Adam and Eve ate the fruit. Now there's a third type of death. And I'll just take up one passage. Um, boy, there's a couple of ways I could go with this. But let me, let me just take you to Matthew chapter 8. It's, it's a little in front of where you're at, not very far. It's, in the, um, it's still in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 8. You want to look at verse 11 and 12 where Christ is talking here. Eternal death is the separation of the body and the spirit from God forever. You could add the soul in there, too. The man's soul, spirit, and body is separated from God forever. And I'm going to take you to two spots. The first one is Matthew chapter 8, verse 11 and 12. And there it says, Jesus talking here, I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. What's, what's been going on in the context is this was when the centurion, a Roman, it's not a Jewish man, had, had shown such great faith in Christ and his ability to heal. He said, you don't even have to come to my house. And Jesus had just commented and said, I have not seen such great faith in all of Israel. And then he says in verse 11, the verse we just read, that there are going to be people from all over the world that are going to come down and sit with, with the great patriarchs of the faith in, in, in God's kingdom. But verse 12, but the children of the kingdom, he's talking about now many of his own countrymen and many of his own Jewish, uh, fellow Jewish people, Christ speaking, shall be cast into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's how the Bible describes this, how Jesus is describing hell. A place of outer darkness, weeping and gnashing of teeth. You'll notice it's not a place where people are unconscious. It's a, peop a place of where all of the goodness and the grace of God is absent. And that's hell. And I want you to notice a second passage uh, in Revelation chapter 20, this is where, where we could have gotten today, 
possibly, depending on how much time I had to take in the first part of the chapter. So we will come back here in another week or so. Um, Revelation chapter 20. And I want you to notice, um, I'm starting at verse 12, okay? Revelation is the last book of the Bible. You go to the, your back cover, and you just go in front of that, and you'll, you'll get to Revelation 20. It's just one of the last chapters of the Bible. Revelation chapter 20, starting with verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. Now, what does that tell us, okay? If these people are dead standing before God, okay, then there's life after death, right? We also see that they're, they're physically dead, and yet they're standing in front of God to be judged, okay? All right? And the books, were, and bo the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works, which means people are going to stand before God and give an account for how they've lived. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell, or Hades, gave up the, delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. So it doesn't matter where you were buried or how those circumstances came about, whether your body was burned or whether it was uh, 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 decayed out at sea, God's going to gather up all the physically dead of all the ages. They're going to stand before him. And these are, by the way, these are only lost people. The saved have already been resurrected early in the chapter. These are only lost people. Verse 14, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Notice it. This is the second death. And whosoever was now found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So what is death? Death is, there's a, there are three aspects of it. Physical death, the separation of the body from the soul. Spiritual death, the separation of the spirit of man from God. Eternal death, separation of body, soul, and spirit of man from God forever. Now, let me give you a couple misconceptions about death. How about this one? Two soldiers um, standing side by side. All of a sudden, one of them is shot. The other one is untouched. If this man dies, this man remains. And so... Many people are struck by the fact and say this type of thing, that death is so random. But is death random? No, it's not. No, it's not. Think of how many people, that we lost more people in the Civil War than all of our other wars combined. Over 600,000 people died in the Civil War. How many people came back with stories like that? But how many Civil War veterans are alive today? None of them. Death is not random. Death is universal. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 says, As it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. Death is not random. That's the way it appears sometimes. Death is universal. Let me give you another thing that is often thought today, and that is death is unfair. The idea that a person who takes very good care of himself or herself exercises, does all the right things, and they come down with cancer. Someone that may smoke cigarettes and, and abuse uh, alcohol, drugs, and all that kind of thing, and, and yet they son somehow seem to live into their um, upper years. And you say to yourself, you know, it just seems so unfair. Why does this child have to come down with cancer? and die? Why does this pastor we just talked about this morning find out, and within the week he's dead? In the prime of life he's leaves a wife and two young children behind. Is death unfair? No. Ezekiel 18.4 says, God says this, Behold, all the souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sins it shall die. That's the same thing he told Adam back in the Garden of Eden. Adam, if you disobey my commands, you're going to die. That's the way it's going to work. And it hasn't changed. God hasn't changed his standard one iota. It hasn't changed at all. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is what? Death. What are wages? Payments. It's what you earned. So none of us is going to stand before God and say, I should not have died. 
There's no way that I should have got, it, it, it's, it's a question in God as, as to when he wants to take you. There is absolutely not a human being on this planet who's ever going to say, God, I shouldn't have died. That's just completely unfair. Here's another, another misconception about death, and that is death is, is the end. Actually, what the scripture teaches, death is just a doorway into eternity. And so let's look at, let's look at it from, the, first of all, there's life after death, and then secondly, that there's death after death. So let's talk about, for those that accept Christ as Savior, life being after death. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Apostle Paul is dealing with actually a, a heresy that was arising in the church. The Corinthians were, were being influenced by it, and that is that, that death was the end, even as a Christian, that, you know, uh, you die and that's it. And so he's been arguing that throughout the whole chapter. I won't, I won't go into all the arguments, but basically what he's saying is this. The fact that Jesus rose from the dead means that, that there is a resurrection. And if you deny the resurrection, then you're denying the, the resurrection of Christ, and that, that whole gospel falls apart at that point. And so now we're coming down to his conclusions. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I'm at verse 51. Paul says this, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. But it's a great sign to put out in front of the nursery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. Okay, so he's talking now about believers and their resurrection. He says that the dead, these are dead believers, are going to be raised incorruptible. What does incorruptible mean? You're not going to be corrupted again. You're not going to die again. This is being raised to eternal life. We shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And he's talking about the victory there. It's the victory over death. So in a very real sense, I did not say goodbye to my dad this past week. I said, I'll see you later. That's the reality. When my dad passed away, um, Thank God I was, I, was, I was awake, I was watching him. And I, my mom had just gone into the bathroom, and, and I watched as, 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 I'd never seen, I've only been with one other person when they passed away. And um, I just noticed, like, the color drained out of his face. That was interesting to me. And I watched his breathing. He had sleep apnea, so he would stop breathing every once in a while anyway, but it became very, very slow and very irregular. And I, I alerted my sister, Lois. I said, I think Dad's going. She got my other sister up. We, there were the three of us and my mom in the room. My mom, um, and I'm watching as his breathing slows down. And um, mom uh, just got out in time basically to give him a couple kisses and say that she loved him, and he was gone. And I'm really glad it worked that way. But I got in my mom's face at that point, and I said this. I said, I do not feel sorry for my father. He's rejoicing with the Lord right now. He's never going to feel pain again. I feel sorry for you. Because you're without him. And that's what the scripture tells us. That, that our loved ones, they're, they're, they're with, with the Lord. There is life after death. Let me show you another passage that, that the Apostle Paul used to encourage Christians on. It's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And I want you to look with me um, at verses 13 to 18. And, and why this was so significant is the Thessalonian believers, they were very, very young in the faith. Paul had only, I think he was there for like three Sabbaths, okay? So about somewhere between three and five weeks maybe. 
And um, then he had to leave town. He had taught them about Christ. He had taught them that Christ was returning. They knew that. What he had not um, gotten to was what happens to people who die before Christ's return. They didn't know that. And so he's filling in that gap in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse, um, verse 13 to verse 18. It says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. What does he mean by asleep? Have died. That ye sorrow not as others which have no hope. Don't sorrow as others. So what he's saying is, we do sorrow, but it's not the same. It's not goodbye forever. It is, I will see you again. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So we grieve when we lose a loved one who knows Christ. Now, if you don't have the assurance that they know Christ, it's a different grief, is it not? But I would say this too. God sometimes works in a person's heart and you don't see it. Okay, If you and I had been relatives of the thief on the cross and we weren't at the cross, we wouldn't have realized what God had done there. So there can be times when you have a loved one and you witness to them and you may not see the... For, I'm, I'm not saying that's always the case. I'm just saying that w I am not preaching anybody into hell because I do not know that. I don't know what God did in their last life, in their last moments. And it does bring me some modicum of comfort with those that... that um, that don't know the Lord. But there is life after death. And we can rejoice in that. There, but there's also death after death, isn't there? Let me show you. Um, we've talked about Revelation. Okay, you're in th if you're in 1 Thessalonians with me, we're going to go toward the front a little bit to the Gospel of John. John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29. And Christ is speaking here. And he lays out um, what's happening. By the way, um, another passage just to give you that there's death after death is Luke chapter 16 where Jesus is talking about the uh, rich man and Lazarus, if you remember. And when the rich man dies, Jesus said, in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. Yes, there's death after death. And what I mean by death is not, don't think of death again as, as extinction. Death is not extinction, it's separation. Okay. John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29, Jesus speaking, he says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. There's life after death. There's death after death. I remember preaching that at a funeral for a guy that I did not know and again, I'm not going to preach him into heaven or hell. That's not my job. But this guy had had a rough lifestyle. And so he had a bunch of rough guys at the funeral. And when I preached that there's life after death, boy, their heads were up and down. <laughs> and then when I preached that there's death after death, <laughs> they didn't like that so well. But what are you going to do? Okay, let me draw some conclusions quickly. First of all, uh, because of these realities about death, uh, as a, it, we, we understand that it's a consequence of sin, and as such, death is a curse. It is the separation that divides us from our loved ones. It does. It strikes at random times, does it not? It is universal in that it does come, but it strikes at random times. And it brings great sorrow and loss and fear. But on the other side of the coin, as a necessary factor in salvation, because you need to get out of that sin-cursed body to be with God forever. You can't go to God's presence. In, that's why God, he guarded that tree of life. As a necessary factor in salvation, death is a doorway into eternal life. And so in, in Psalm 116 and verse 15, he says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. 
It's a, it's a wonderful thing. God's going to, and, and, and I'm sure right now my dad is, is, is living uh, like he's never lived in the presence of God and enjoying his blessing. I'd like you to uh, go to, okay, but let me give you two passages to close this out, okay? The first one is 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So we're in John, and the second one's going to be in Luke, which is right near John, so I don't know if you want to keep that in mind. But 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is a passage that I think we need to think about um, because I think this gives me great encouragement. I'm convinced that people do not enter into what I call soul sleep. You know what I mean by that? That when they die, it's not that they are asleep in the grave. We, we use that metaphor, and the Scriptures uses the metaphor, but it does not mean that a person, when they die, is asleep until the resurrection. Why do I say that? Well, this passage is one of the reasons, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. A second one, if you want to look at it, is when the Apostle Paul is talking in Philippians chapter 1, and he says, I have, I'm in this, uh, as he calls it in the, in the King James, a straight betwixt two. The idea is I'm kind of torn between two, two options. He says, on the one hand, I would like to go and be with Christ, which is far better. On the other hand, I'd like to remain in the flesh because that's more needful for you. Now look, if he's just going to go to sleep, I don't think that's in the Apostle Paul's. He's not excited about going to sleep. He's excited about going to see Christ. So I'm convinced that he's looking not for a sleep. He's looking for it be in Christ's presence as soon as he dies. Notice if you would, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and starting at verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved. Okay, now what's the house of the tabernacle? That's your body. So you could just put it this way. We know that if our body dissolves, if our body decays, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. That's our eternal body. For this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. I want that new body, don't you? If so be that being clothed we shall be, not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle, in this body, do groan, being burdened. Not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. He's saying we're not wishing for death. But we sure would like that new body. I, I, I get that what he's saying on that. Now he that wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given us the earnest of the Spirit. The idea of the Holy Spirit coming within us, it's like the down payment on this, this wonderful inheritance that we have. Therefore, we are always confident knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. Okay, let me explain. Verse 6 is saying this. When I am living in my sin-cursed body, I cannot be in the presence of God. Does that make sense? Because I, I'm a sinner. Okay? But look at verse 7. We walk not by faith, but by sight. That's how we have to live, isn't it? We are confident, verse 8, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. That's where we want to be. When I get rid of this sin-cursed body and my sin nature is forever gone, I can be in the presence of God forever. And verse 9 says, Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. So while we're still in this sin-cursed body, we need to serve him with our hearts. Okay, the second passage I wanted you to go to is, I'll, 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 I'll just give you Luke chapter, um, 20, uh, chapter 12. And starting with verse 16, while you're flipping there, let me just give you some applications. First of all, sin is serious, folks. It's serious. I think sometimes in our society, we so emphasize the grace of God, and we ought to emphasize the grace of God. But we, we, tend, to, we tend to go light on the issue of sin. My dad died because he's a sinner. That's why every man dies. That's why there's suffering and pain in this world. It's because we're sinners. And it doesn't mean a specific sin, but the idea is simply this, this. The curse of sin is upon this planet and upon every one of us. And it's serious. James chapter 1 and verse 15 says, When lust has conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. So we ought to prepare for death, shouldn't we? If sin is serious, and we know that death is coming, we ought to prepare for it. So Luke chapter 12 Give us an example of a guy that didn't prepare. Verse 16. And he spake a parable 
unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And I just want you to notice all of the personal pronouns about this guy, all that he's saying to himself. And think about what he's not saying, okay? Verse 17. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thy knees, eat, drink, and be merry. So as he's talking to himself, who's he talking about? Himself. Who's he not talking about? Anything about God or eternity. And God said unto him, Thou fool. This night thy soul shall be required of thee. Oh, there's one of those random times. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Prepare for death. How do you do that? Make sure you know Christ himself. Make sure you know him. 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 to 13 says this is the record that God has given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that has the Son has life. He that does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. What's God saying? The eternal life is all wrapped up in, in, in knowing Jesus as your Savior. The way to prepare for death is to make sure that you know Christ. Remember how Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. How do you prepare for death? Make sure you know Christ yourself. And also, go about helping others to prepare. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if we had kept going, Paul says that we are ambassadors for Christ. And now we are to beseech others in Christ's stead to be reconciled to God. I'm going to read one passage as I close it up. You don't have to turn there. Because I told you to. I'm not going to break my word to you. But in, in Revelation chapter 21, listen to what he says here. What, how beautiful this is. This is talking about what we would call the eternal state. And the Apostle John says this. He said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. Now that's a nice name for what? The New Jerusalem, the holy city is heaven. He's talking about heaven. Coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. He said, the best way I can describe this city, it was so perfect, it's like a bride on her wedding day. He says, and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. What he's saying is this, God's going to dwell with man. Imagine that. What Adam and Eve had and what they lost. He will dwell with them. They shall be his people. God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. You know, that's all, you know what that is? That's the curse of sin. What he's saying is this. The curse of sin one day is going to be wiped away. All of it. Death, sorrow, pain, all of it. Tears. All going to be gone. And he that sat upon the throne, guess who that is? That's God, right? He that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. He's saying this. You can't, he said, I want you to write this down, John, and I want you to understand something. This is really going to happen. It's true, it's faithful. Because he knows this. We have a hard time believing that. We can't imagine a world without sin. We can't imagine a world without death and pain and sorrow and crying. We don't even know what it's like. God said it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And that's why when, when someone uh, uh, who knows Christ as Savior goes on to be heaven, in heaven, I don't care how old they are, you can rejoice for them. They're not sorrowing. They're not crying. They're not wringing their hands. And by the way, I don't think they're watching us down here either. I think that'd be discouraging. But you know what? They're with the Lord. They're rejoicing with Him. They're experiencing things we've never, never thought of. What a blessing. Don't, don't weep for them. We sorrow, don't we, because we lose people. We sorrow for ourselves. 
for those that we love who are hurting, we don't sorrow for the person that's gone on to be with the Lord. I don't think my wife would mind me mentioning, there's been times over the years, Molly watched her sister die of cancer. What was she, maybe 42? And that was a tough experience for Molly. It was really hard. And of course, she got diagnosed with cancer just a couple weeks after that. She went through that experience. But um, when she saw her sister die, different times over the years, she's come back and she's felt badly for all that her sister went through. But you know what I do? I remind her, she's not suffering anymore. You don't have to feel sorry for her. That's all behind her. She's rejoicing with the Lord. Don't, don't feel pity for your sister. It's all gone. It's all done. And that's the blessing of knowing Christ as your Savior. Do you know Him? If you don't, death should scare you. But when you know Christ as Savior, it's a different thing, isn't it? We look forward to what's beyond that door. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the joy of just taking a few minutes to talk about a subject that we don't like to talk about a lot, and that is death. Lord, um, it's encouraging when we understand there's justice in it. It's not random. It's not, uh, uh, it's not unjust. Oh, Lord, it's not at all. It is the result of the fact that we're all sinners, and so we are all under that penalty. Lord, what we didn't talk this morning about is the death that our Savior died in our place so that we could be forgiven. <laughs> that His substitutionary death on our behalf makes it possible for us to be delivered from the consequence, the eternal consequences of death, from the eternal separation. Lord, you've made it possible through the blood of Christ that we could be forgiven and cleansed from all sin and could live with you in harmony and love forever. And I pray for any who may be here, and there may be several in a group this size. And yes, maybe they've heard it repeatedly, but the reality is they've never really put their faith in, in Christ for salvation. Maybe they've thought you were unjust. Oh Lord, may you deliver them. May you open their spiritual eyes. And we pray for people to be in heaven because of considering death. And Lord, we also pray for Christians, many of whom already know several who have gone on before them. Some of whom, some in our midst are concerned because we have loved ones right now that, that could be crossing those waters soon. Lord, I pray for those who have unsaved loved ones. Help us, Lord. Help us to do our best to warn them. Help us do our best to reach them, to love them, to the Savior. But, oh, Lord, for those of us that have believing loved ones, may we be at their side, may we be an encouragement, may we be a, a blessing to them in your name. And we look forward to seeing those who you've called on before us. Thank you for this time that we've had together. Accomplish what you want in each heart, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. With our heads bowed for just a moment, can I ask, is there someone here to say, Pastor, I'm, if I'm honest, I'm not ready to die because I'm not certain that Christ is my Savior. I'm really not. But I understand. I understand that, that Jesus did die for me and that He wants to forgive me and He wants to give me eternal life and, give, and, and free me from the curse of death. Yes, I, I understand I'm going to die physically one day if, if I don't live to the Lord's return, but, but I, I also know that, that I can be delivered from eternal death and have eternal life through Christ. Does anyone like that? And say, if you just slip up a hand where I, where I can see you so I can help you after the service. Anyone like that? I, I want to make sure I'm ready to stand before God. Now, as I'm looking, I'm not seeing any hands, but if I missed you, or even if you got thinking about it afterward, don't hesitate. I'll be at the, at the main door there and feel free to talk to me. If you have someone else that you're more comfortable with, you feel free to do that. And I ask Christian... Are you, are you living a life in preparation for standing before God? Do you have loved ones? You know, Marcia went down through her Rolodex and basically was calling people up, saying, I'm going to be going soon. I want to tell you I love you. I want to see you in heaven. Now, we don't have that opportunity. Maybe we're not under that kind of a sentence. We're not under hospice. But, but should we be reaching out? I think probably we should, obviously, shouldn't we? Maybe God's put someone on your heart. I encourage you to pray about that. Ask God, God, give me an opportunity. Help me. Help me to share the gospel with people who need it right now. 
And some others of you may be like in my situation where you're dealing with a loss. May I just encourage you to look beyond death to, the, to eternity. If that person knew Christ as Savior, it's a comfort. It really is. And, and, uh, and, and keep in mind, if you don't have that confidence that, it's, that I'm not saying it necessarily happened, but Christ does often reach people at the end. Let's be faithful to tell them so they have something that they can grab onto. Lord, thank you for this time together. I pray that you'd encourage Christians today who are discouraged. We also pray, Lord, that you'd help us all to realize that death is a reality that we deserve, that we're headed for. And so help us to prepare to meet our God. Thank you for Christ taking our place on the cross so that we could be forgiven of all sin. And Lord, that we could live with you forever. And I pray that you would also help those who, who still grieve the loss of a loved one. And it is perfectly legitimate as, as, as they feel uh, just the pain of missing a loved one. Oh Lord, encourage their heart. Uh, And may they draw near to you, realizing that you are with them and you will go through them through those dark and difficult days when you understand and no one else does. Pray that you dismiss us with your blessing. We thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen.